Good morning, everybody. Hi, my name is Sarah Dorr. I work with ISA. I'm here today with Rosalind Grandy. She's the pharmacy librarian at the University of Connecticut. Today, she's going to be talking about managing your author profiles and online research presence. So today's uh, webinar will begin with a presentation by Rosalind, and then we'll have time for questions and a discussion at the end. In the meantime, if you want to write a question in the chat or in the Q&A feature, um, that, that's fine as well. So Rosalind, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. All right, um, thanks so much for having me. Um, as Sarah said, my name is Rosalind Brandy. I am the pharmacy librarian at UConn. And as someone who works um, very closely with faculty and grad students on um, supporting their research, um, an important part of my job is kind of um, keeping up with the publication's life cycle and um, knowing how to pull and communicate different metrics about publishing. Um, so that's kind of how I got um, into this area, which is an interest of mine. Um, so yeah, today we're going to talk about different author profiles that exist that you might want to claim um, and how to improve and manage your online research presence. Mm -hmm. So there are quite a few reasons to um, care about your author profiles. Um, the most important being ensuring that any research you produce is attributed to you um, on various platforms. Another thing that does happen sometimes with these automatic tools um, is that sometimes they attribute publications to you that uh, weren't actually published by you. So you want to make sure that um, nothing is inaccurate there. And I'll give an example of that shortly. Um, you want to increase the visibility and discoverability of your research. So having it on multiple platforms um, to claim your profile will really make your research discoverable in a variety of ways. You can get a sense of the impact that your work is having so how often is it being cited or mentioned in different places? It can help you notice or to get noticed by um, potential collaborators, um, co-authors, um, people who may be tangentially interested in that topic. Um, so grant funders are also going to be Googling you, um, looking at your uh, research presence online, how you present yourself. Um, these metrics can also help in the promotion and tenure process. So there are a lot of different ways that you can um, kind of toot your own horn, and I'll be giving you some suggestions for that. And finally, it can enhance the reputation of your um, department or your institution. Um, by just being present in those spaces. So although a lot of these tools will automatically generate a profile for you, they often get things wrong um, or just don't capture everything that you've produced because it may not be published in a journal, it may be in another place, but you still want a record of that. Um, so you are the most important and most reliable advocate for your authorship, um, which is why it's important to claim those profiles and manage them. So there are a few key players in the research metrics um, arena. And I just wanna give you an overview because we can get kind of word salad with the vendor versus the product. Um, so Clarivate is kind of the um, old school, first one on the scene in the research metrics um, department. Their product is called Web of Science, also called Researcher ID. Um, Scopus came out next, and that's kind of a comparable product to Web of Science, and they use Author ID, and that is um, comes from Elsevier, one of the largest scientific publishers. 
um, Google Scholar also serves as a citation index, and we'll go over what that is later. Um, but I assume many of you are familiar with Google Scholar and have used that in a variety of ways. And then um, ORCID is the last kind of key player, and I'm going to go over what that is now. So that stands for Open Researcher and Contributor ID. Um, so we typically just say ORCID, not ORCID ID, because that is a little bit redundant. Um, if you have submitted to a journal recently, it's likely that they asked you to enter your ORCID or maybe required it. Um, this is a free, unique, persistent author ID. So an ORCID is to an author what a DOI is to an article. It's a permanent identifier, even if you switch institutions, you change your name, um, this number will still be linked to you. And it disambiguates you from other authors who might have a similar name or initial combination. You can control your profile on ORCID, so you can add your education, uh, work experience. They also let you put in presentations, things that aren't necessarily peer reviewed. Um, any grants that you have received, your activity as a peer reviewer. And after you set it up, many of the functions are automated. Um, so they will kind of um, automatically appear in multiple places once you have claimed your ORCID. Um, and I just wanted to point out that sometimes the ORCID is very visible on the publisher's website. This is an example I've given with a um, SAGE article. So they have the ORCID right there. And then it'll link, if you click the ID here, it'll save you the ORCID profile as well as Google Scholar CL articles in SAGE by this author. Um, but other times it is just in the background. It's in kind of the, the XML metadata of the web page. Um, but it will still be doing the linking for you. Um, ORCID is a nonprofit, so it is managed by member institutions. Um, I work at UConn and we are a member, so it is free. It is It does not have ads um, and it does kind of have this nonprofit model, um, much like DOI. All right, I'm going to take you into an ORCID profile. I need to accept all of the cookies. Okay, so um, I'm going to be using this um, UConn professor as an example today because he is kind of an all-star in terms of claiming profiles and having a presence on multiple sites. So this is his um, Dr. Bowman, his ORCID profile. This is his unique 16-digit identifier. And let's say that you come across an ORCID um, that is you. You can create an account and sign in to start editing that. He has linked to his lab website and also to his Scopus profile. So a lot of these profiles do link to each other. Um, so you can kind of set that up um, after you claim a profile. He's got the keywords. This is the, the main things that he studies. And this is where he is located. So he has a few um, jobs here. You can also put also known as if he's published as something else. So under his jobs, he's got the education and qualifications. <clears throat> um, so you can put as many professional memberships in here as you would like. These are grants that he has received. <clears throat> and it would also tell you the source of that information. So this is coming from a linked tool whereas this one he directly put in himself. And he's got 46, uh, 64 works. So that could be peer reviewed as well as um, presentations or other. Okay. 
Um, and then he has, he has served as a peer reviewer for several publications. Um, so that's generally what is in ORCID. Um, I tout this as kind of the most important, the key one, because it does link and build um, with other services. Another thing that you can do um, if you want to have like a quick link to all of your publications is just put this in your email signature. Um, if you prefer another platform over ORCID, you can put that in, but I would definitely recommend doing that and just as a, this is what I'm all about to anyone who you are emailing. Because a lot of publishers require an ORCID, a lot of them are kind of orphans out there. So only 42% of ORCID profiles have something other than author name. Um, only 28% have actual works attached to them. So there are a lot of unclaimed profiles and that's definitely going to dilute the impact that you're having. So make sure that you um, claim your ORCID so that you can kind of start constructing your research story. And um, there's a couple of terms that I just want to define, make sure that you know the what I'm referring to in the rest of the presentation. So bibliometrics, um, that's something that I specialize in, also called research metrics, publishing metrics, um, a few ways to describe that. But in the library world, we refer to it as bibliometrics. So this is statistical analysis um, used to tra track both output and impact of a researcher. So it is a um, quantitative figure, generally measured by the amount of times a um, publication is cited or mentioned in other sources. So it includes things like the H index, G index, and journal impact factors. Um, so I'll go over all of those later. And then citation index is the other definition I wanted to establish. So this is something that compiles and organizes metadata of academic literature across um, different disciplines. It's going to provide data such as um, which other publications are citing this certain article or book chapter. So Web of Science and Scopus are the most authoritative sources um, for bibliometric data. They are both very expensive subscriptions. So typically institutions only subscribe to one, um, but it's important to have a profile on both of them because your um, grantor, for example, may subscribe to Web of Science, but you only have your Scopus profile um, claimed and beefed up um, so that may affect you and kind of how you're perceived to people who only subscribe to Web of Science. Um, so again, this is from Clarivate. And even if you don't subscribe to Web of Science, you can claim your free researcher ID. Most of these um, subscription services have a dimension or a subset that is free to use. So this covers many disciplines, science, social science, arts, humanities. Um, if you use uh, EndNote, you may notice that your login will be the same because that's also a Clarivate product. And it does integrate pretty well with ORCID. I'm gonna show you um, Dr. Bowman's Web of Science profile. The load times can um, go down when I'm sharing the screen, so it should be good to move up here. Okay, so this is a claimed profile. He's added his own photo, and you can tell that it's claimed by this green check mark. Um, different names that he publishes under, awards that he's received, and as you can see, that ORCID is linked here. Um, so once you have claimed an ORCID and you enter it, 
when you're um, submitting for publication. A lot of these profiles will just automatically populate, so you won't have to manually add, like, yes, this was me on this publication. Um, it'll all just communicate via your ORCID, so that's why um, I think this is the most important one to have. It'll give you a summary of his profile, so how many total documents he has, preprints versus dissertation versus peer reviews. Um, his age index, so that's one of those metrics that we talked about, how many um, times that he's been cited. Um, right now we're looking at newest first, but if we wanted to, we could say what's his most highly cited work. And this um, particular article has been cited 359 times. So different ways to kind of view that. If you look at this, this is a premium thing, this is a premium thing, that's because UConn doesn't subscribe to Web of Science, but we do have access to kind of this module within Web of Science. So we can get um, basic information about this author and his age index. Um, so I'm just showing you here that you can do this, verify your author record. You would search for yourself and then it will detect anything that, yes, we think this is you, is it you, confirm. Um, you can also add email addresses from current or former institutions and that will um, help to pull in your publications. And then you can add manually by identifier or a file upload. And then here is that sync with ORCID option. Um, so one of the things that I mentioned at the beginning was managing citations that are incorrectly attributed to you. Um, so Web of Science, they just revamped their author profile um, module about a year ago, and there are still a lot of bugs with it. So I claimed my profile, and after I did that, it kind of dumped a lot of citations that I did not publish into my profile. So there was something by Rodrigo Randy published and it's their algorithm said, oh, we think this is you. Um, I have to tell them that no, I did not publish this. So that this top one was auto added and this bottom one is actually me, something that I did publish. So I'm definitely not doing any stem cell research that is beyond my expertise. Um, this was another um, case that I came across where an author was doing just what I encourage you to do in this workshop, and that was, you know, checking out her research presence online, and she found an unpleasant surprise. So she is a professor who um, specializes on diasporas and voting, and she found an article that was she was listed as the sole author, published in the African Journal of Political Science um, about government intervention measures on recycling in China, which is not remotely what she publishes. Um, so this is a predatory journal um, publishing. They actually plagiarized an existing article and then slapped her name on it, even though it's, it was nothing to do with what she um, studies. So this is another thing that you want to be aware of, that I'm sure you're aware that predatory publishers do exist. And this is one way that they try to take advantage of authors. All right, so now I'm gonna talk about Scopus, which is kind of the Elsevier version of Web of Science. They use author ID. And again, that module of Scopus is available to anyone. Uh, it is also multidisciplinary. It's a little better with conference proceeding and book series coverage than Web of Sciences, um, but otherwise pretty similar. And it does integrate with ORCID. Um, this is another thing that you can do on Web of Science, but I'm just giving you an example in Scopus. So here is an author that you may recognize. 
um, Tony Fauci. He has a few author profiles within Scopus. Um, so Scopus will err on the side of caution with its um, automatic author profiles. It will say this could be him, but in case it's not, we're just going to generate another profile. So that happened a few times, but most of them are consolidated under that one profile. If he wanted to make his H index possibly a tiny bit higher, he could combine all of his various auto profiles into one um, that he manages. So you can um, just select all of them and then you would do this request to merge. So I'm gonna show you um, Dr. Bowman's profile. Um, so this one tells you that it was auto-generated by Scopus, so he hasn't actually claimed this one, um, and he has an old affiliation. He doesn't have his current affiliation of Yukon listed here, um, so that's kind of an example of inaccurate information that could be out there, that could be perceived by someone who comes across this. Um, ORCID is linked, so at least that much is done. Um, something Scopus does is kind of this throughout time when you've published versus when you've been cited. Um, so that's kind of a, a way that you can look. Cited by different preprints that you have, list of co authors. Um, so Web of Science also will track that. Different grants you've been awarded. Um, something that you can do in both Web of Science and Scopus is set an alert. So if you want to know any time that you get cited, the one of your publications get cited, you can do that. Um, you could also just perform a search, um, including your name, including your department, just a topic that you are researching on and get um, alerts when something new is published on that. So um, a lot of different tools that can be used within these citation managers. Um, and this kind of parses out when he was the single author, when he was the last or corresponding a co-author. Um, so that could be relevant to show um, based on how you want to kind of tell that story. And again, this defaults to searching newest, but we could see what's his most highly cited article. So within Scopus, because it is, it pulls from slightly different sets of data, it's going to have a little bit different um, numbers, but it is the same article that, that is the most highly cited. Um, so Google Scholar is not subscription-based. It's freely available. It is multidisciplinary. And because it's free, it is the most used worldwide. Um, it does give citation counts for books and conference papers, which Web of Science um, does a terrible job with. Scopus does an, a decent job with. Um, but Google Scholar is a lot better with those citation counts. And it also provides more flexibility with source types. So you can do software, websites, technical reports, patents, books. Um, so a lot beyond just journals. It doesn't directly link with ORCID, ORCID but you can export to ORCID. Um, also, another place where you can discover and follow other authors. However, um, Google Scholar is a non-profit generating arm of Google, and they actually have a very small team that maintains it. Um, I'm always scared that it's going to disappear one day uh, because of that non-profit um, status, but, or non-profit generating. For now, it is around. It does have some weaknesses. So I wouldn't suggest using Google to generate citations. So you can click on this little um, quotation mark and that'll generate a citation for you. 
but I don't recommend it because it does not include DOIs. Um, it has a lot more records. So 400 million versus 72 million. <clears throat> but within that, there are a lot of repeats and just plain inaccurate information. So this was something that I came across. Um, this book was published in 2011, and it's claiming that a book, an article, uh, yes, book published in 1996 referred to it, which is impossible. Um, so sometimes there's just bad information. There will be tons of versions of uh, an article. So the citation counts are just going to be overinflated with that. Um, and there are also predatory journals indexed in the World Scholar. They don't um, do as much quality control as Scopus and Web of Science do. So those are just some limitations to be aware of. I'm going to show you um, Dr. Bowman's profile. So this is one that he has claimed. Um, important thing to note about Google Scholar, you can use your personal Gmail to claim it. I would suggest that so that when you, if you change institutions, it will kind of move with you. But um, you can verify an email. So it's saying, yes, we made sure that his institutional email is active. So this is really good. You can put keywords of what he studies. Um, I tend index, that is something that is unique to Google. And if you hover over, it'll tell you number of publications with at least 10 citations. So it's, that's a very um, simple one, whereas the H index is a slightly more complicated formula. And that one article rises to the top again. It has significantly more citations because of that duplicates, multiple versions, um, kind of just the nature of Google Scholar. And um, this will list his co-authors, so people who might be um, publishing on similar topics. And you can switch between currency and cited by, just like you can in the other citation managers. Um, and this is really easy for following. So if you have your own Google Scholar profile, you can just click follow and you will get notified when he publishes something new. Um, there's something else I wanna show you you can do in Google Scholar once you have claimed the profile. Um, so this is a professor who created a software called Publisher Parish that you may have heard of. And if you look, it has this um, little star. And what she found is that her software was referred to a zillion different ways on the internet. So Publisher Parish 2014, parsing.com, Publisher Parish. And what she did was combine them all into kind of one record on Google Scholar. And that way her cited by number um, was much higher looking at it combined versus parsed out when it's actually all the same um, software. So that's just one example of something that you can do um, when you claim and manage your own profile. Great. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what the H index is. Um, so this was created in 2005 by a physicist named Jorge, Jorge Hirsch. So that's kind of where the H comes from. It is a simultaneous measure of output and impact. Um, so basically what it is, is if you have published at least 10 papers and each of those have been cited at least 10 times, then your H index um, would be 10. If you have published one paper that's been cited 100 times and that's all you've published, your H index is still gonna be one. And then conversely, if you've published um, 100 papers, but only once one of them has been cited once, your H index is one. Um, so this is pretty informative for physics, medicine, um, a lot of the basic science fields. 
but for social science and humanities, it tends to be less informative. Um, also, if you are citing yourself or working on a large, large collaboration, it's going to overinflate your H index. And it also does penalize early career researchers. Um, so if there are any um, department chairs or deans on, um, I would encourage you to not put too much um, emphasis on the H index. It is just one way to measure um, impact. It is not the only way. I'm going to be talking about some other ways. It also is going to vary from platform to platform because they pull data from different sources. So if you look at Dr. Bowman's on um, Scopus and Web of Science, they're going to be pretty similar to 28 and 26, whereas Google is often going to be higher um, because of that duplicate information. There are many alternatives to the H index. So I mentioned the one that um, Google Scholar generates. This is the number of publications with at least 10 citations. Um, the G index is similar to H index, but it allows the highly cited papers to bolster low cited papers. And then um, you are probably familiar with the term altmetrics, which is a general term for um, anything that is not citation based. And that could include things like blogs, Wikipedia mentions, media coverage, social media mentions, um, as well as peer evaluation. Um, Altmetric is a specific product that tracks general altmetrics. Um, so this was a highly cited article in medicine. It had, it's got this attention score of 3,086. And you can see across the top, the different types of sources that they track. So news, blogs, Twitter, patents, Google Plus, doesn't exist anymore, um, Reddit. And then it will tell you the locations, like where that article is being mentioned and talked about. Um, so Altmetric, your institution could subscribe to it, so you have access to the whole thing. Um, if they don't, though, you can access it through the journal as long as they um, have contracted with Altmetric. So this one was published in JAMA, and you would just click Altmetric to get to that page. Um, this is a social science article. So this is going to be a more um, typical site attention score or something in the social sciences. This is still a very highly mentioned. So you can see that this is in the top 5% of all outputs scored. Um, but things in social sciences are going to have kind of a lower mention impact. Um, it has been cited on Twitter, mentioned, um, Facebook, Wikipedia, and in policy documents. Um, so now I want to talk about something called journal impact factor. Um, that's actually a proprietary term uh, from Web of Science. So in general, we speak about it as journal impact. So if you look at um, the top one, I just went into Web of Science and I parsed out what are the most high impact journals. So, and by that we mean their articles are being cited um, by other articles. So in Web of Science, the most highly cited poli sci um, journal is Annual Review of Political Science, and they assign it a um, number. So there's a formula they use to calculate this, but 10.8 is like the highest one in this discipline, and then it goes down from there. Scopus has a comparable um, figure that's called site score, and it's slightly different data, slightly different formula. Um, so it's going to be a different number, but they kind of have the same, they use percentiles and quartiles. And in this one, policy and society is the most highly cited um, journal. If you don't have access to either of these, there is something called Scimago, Schemago. There are different ways to pronounce it. 
um, that also kind of ranks journals. And you can use this um, journal rank indicator, SJR. Um, and the way that you might use this, if you are not, there, there are a few ways to use this. So let's say that you are kind of a new author and you want to know journals in your field that you would have likelihood of getting your article accepted in. You may not want to shoot for one of these top ones, maybe something in like the second or third quartile. Um, so this will kind of give you the, the breakdown of this is kind of how selective that journal may be. Um, if you are kind of further in your career and you really want to publish in a high impact journal, um, then you can use this tool to identify that. You could also use it um, in your promotion documents. You could kind of do a narrative of, um, you know, was published in this journal, which has a journal impact factor of X and has been cited by this amount of people. So if you want to do kind of narrative reflections that aren't necessarily the, the H index of you or um, that particular article, um, you can kind of do it on a journal level. You can say, well, I got published in this journal, which is a very reputable journal in my field. Um, so citation metrics should support your impact story and never supplant it or completely encompass it. Um, it should always be accompanied by other metrics, including peer and supervisor review. Um, I put a couple resources here if you would like to encourage your departments to not overemphasize metrics. Um, there are some resources for doing that. There's this article and then there's this Leiden Manifesto, which is principles to guide uh, research evaluation. Um, another place that you might go to promote yourself is social media or a professional website. Um, these are great because you have more control over the content. They're also discoverable. You can connect with other people. Um, so if you want to have more of like a narrative like Dr. Bowman does about what his research actually is, um, you have that option. And then different fields are on different social media platforms um, as well as academic social media sites. Um, so as ResearchGate and Academia.edu, if your field tends to be on one more than the other, that's where you should be. They do use a for-profit model, unlike ORCID, so there may be ads on here. They may ask you to upload PDFs of your work, so just make sure that you don't violate publisher agreements if you are um, participating in either of these sites because sometimes they will encourage you to do that. Um, so not necessarily bad to be on these um, sites, but you just need to be cautious. Um, there are a lot of other tools out there. One of them is Semantic Scholar. So this is a poli-sci poli professor from UConn. And this is again, a free profile that you can claim semantic scholar. Um, another one that is very important for social science researchers, although it has become more and more multidisciplinary in recent years, um, is called SSRN. And within that, they actually have networks for um, sub-disciplines. So there is a political science um, network and even though this is a preprint server, it also kind of serves as a network. So it'll give you, these are, you know, how many authors are publishing in this um, arena, in this area, how many downloads we've gotten, how many abstracts have been viewed, the top authors, recent papers. Um, so this is uh, definitely a place that I recommend you be active um, if you are in political science. Um, some other tools that I will just mention. So Crossref, Crossref is not a profile. It's kind of a linking tool that you can log into. Meltwater, if you are wanting, um, 
if you're doing like department level metrics and you want to get um, media mentions and downloads there, this is a subscription-based service that you can use to kind of talk up your department. Um, kudos is something that you can use to summarize your work for a lay audience. So it can make your work more accessible um, to maybe school age children, to people who are just not familiar with your discipline. It's kind of the too long didn't read um, summary. So it's just something to know about. And then LinkedIn is also a great place to make sure that you have all your profile, um, all of your publications mentioned. So I went over a lot of different tools today. You could spend a lot of time finding and perfecting your profile on all of them. Uh, but if you have limited time, like I do, especially right now, beginning of the semester, it's been a little crazy. Um, I would recommend, recommend prioritizing ORCID. After that, I would do Scopus and Mortal Science equally because they are um, kind of those authoritative sources for citation metrics. After that, I would do your professional website and then LinkedIn and social media. Um, so when you combine these automatic tools, um, which exist within the publishing ecosystem um, with the profiles that you claim, it can really help you to create a robust story of both your publications and the impact that they're having. Um, a couple of things I wanted to mention before we have time for questions. If you are just getting started with publishing, both Elsevier and Web of Science have um, these tutorial suites and they're free. Um, I've actually found useful content on both of them. So I just wanted to mention them. Um, and then I'm going to end with my contact information. If you do have questions after the session, you're welcome to um, reach out to me, but otherwise I can take some questions now. Thanks so much, Roslyn. I see we have a question from um, someone has raised their hand. Um, so I see one in the Q&A. So <laughs> elaborate on academia and research gate. All right, so let me go over here. Um, so the, the thing about these sites is that they um, can be a little predatory. Like their purpose is to um, make money. And, and I'm not saying Elsevier and Web of Science, that's absolutely their aim as well. Um, but they have a lot of quality control and they're very choosy about the things that they um, index. Um, so like the journals that they um, include in their metrics, whereas there's just much less control with ResearchGate and academia.edu. Um, they're kind of put everything on here and make it all free and give us lots of clicks and downloads. That's essentially um, the model that they are using. Whereas Scopus and Web of Science get their revenue from subscriptions, so they're not concerned with ads and clicks. Um, so I have heard of professors getting in trouble if they submit the version of record, which is the um, publisher's version to Academia, EDU, or ResearchGate because they will send emails to you like, oh, is this you? Make sure you upload the PDF, give us more clicks. Um, so that's kind of the, the model that they're using. And yes, the slides will be available after the webinar. I will send them to um, Kat and Sarah. Are there any other questions in the um, okay. Do you want to type your question, Victor? Um, so using Google Scholar is great. It, um, it's what most people, like the most amount of people are on. Um, the only thing with that is the quality of the data. This kind of goes back to Web of Science and Scopus 
have a lot of quality control. Um, so anything like duplicates, so like inflating your citation metrics, um, that's going to be much more controlled in those two databases, whereas in Google Scholar, it um, their staff is very small, so they're not doing a lot of um, checking, verifying um, about the accuracy, accuracy of information. But I, I use Google Scholar a lot, both for research. I, I think it's really great in, it's much more intuitive in pulling up articles. I use natural language a lot more than databases where you have to, have to use like controlled vocabulary. Um, so it's great for discovering things, both articles and authors. But when it comes to accessing, um, you may need to go through your library's um, resources. Um, so yeah, for research, it depends what your discipline is as far as um, if going into the databases is necessary. Um, as a librarian, I promote databases because they have really um, specific search tools where as Google Scholar, it's just, here's what we think, here's what our algorithm thinks you're looking for. Um, and with the database, you can really drill down specifically. Um, but yeah, in terms of author profiles, it's absolutely good, a great idea to have a Google Scholar profile. Okay, I'm glad that it has um, been enlightening and helpful for you. There's another question in the, the Q&A uh, okay. from Abu Bakr. Um, so the number of citations goes up um, on its own on Google Scholar. Uh, so that's again, the um, Google Scholar is kind of a dump for data. So it's constantly crawling sites on the web without much quality control. So if it finds a, um, let's say the academia.edu version of your publication is slightly different from the Scopus version of your of that same article, it might see them as two different publications. If the metadata varies slightly, um, and then it'll say, oh, well, now you have even more publications. And then the same thing happens on the citing side. If you get cited in an article, and then that article appears in multiple versions in different places, then your citation metrics are can just kind of go up. Uh, but there's a way to verify that yourself. You let me just go into Google Scholar and show this. Um, I think I need to get out of the profile and actually go to Google Scholar. All right, so you can go to this um, cited by, and this particular one is has been cited quite a lot. So it would be a lot of work for you to go through this manually and say, which of these are duplicates. Um, also, another advantage of using um, Scopus and Web of Science is that you could actually export these into a CSV, and that would be much easier to manipulate the data. Whereas I don't believe there's any way to export this on Google Scholar. You can view it, you know, you can just keep scrolling through. This is everything that cited the article. Um, but yeah, and there could also be less reputable journals, predatory journals that are starting citing new work. Do you want to advertise that? It's up to you. All right. 
Um, I have experienced that people do not cite Native Indigenous scholars in the Global South, and that they choose to do cite authors who may be more Western. Um, so that is absolutely something I didn't have time to cover in this presentation, but um, citation me metrics are gendered and absolutely have um, geographical and economic bias. Um, that is a whole uh, area of study um, and debate. So let me see, um, how do we ensure that our profile is more visible? Um, so this one is tricky. It's it's really changing the mindset of administrators and people in the scholarly publishing industry um, about what constitutes a quality journal. Um, I can't, I don't know that I have great advice on changing everyone's perception of that um, because there are absolutely high quality, important journals published in the Global South that need visibility, that need to be cited. Um, one thing I will say is open access articles tend to be cited more highly than um, articles in subscription journals. So if you're able to publish open access, there's fees associated with that. So it's depending on your institution, if they can help you or not. Um, so I would look for open access publications and um, there's not really a, I think there was something that came out years ago called Beale's List of Predatory Publishers and he took it down because there were quite a few debates about why are you saying this is predatory when it's actually just, you know, new or unknown? Um, so yeah, that is something that we are have to grapple with as a, as a field. And all I can say is be in all the places, the citation indexes, Google Scholar, um, the social media, and you'll have the a better chance of being noticed and cited. Rosalind, can I build on this question from uh, Abhishek and just and just say that I found it really interesting the idea of an impact narrative um, and bringing in alt metrics. Would that be would be creating an impact narrative be a helpful way to support? Um, yeah, like during the promotion tenure process, um, there are so many ways to spin, uh, to talk yourself up. And um, like, there are a lot of those free tools. So if, if you wanna use the Google Scholar numbers that are super inflated, go ahead. <laughs> like, just say where you got it. And you know, that, that's gonna give you the highest citation count. Mm -hmm. And um, like your department is going to have its own um, criteria, so make sure you meet those. But beyond that, uh, use any sort of metric, see where does this publication fit on different lists. If you don't have access to other science or um, Scopus, then you can use that Sci Mago. Um, just find where where does it appear in relation to other journals of that field. Um, yeah, we as librarians um, are pushing back on the exorbitant costs of all these subscriptions. So we're hoping to do our part of uh, kind of lessening that gatekeeping um, that the two big citation nexus have on scholarly publishing. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any more questions? I don't see anything in the Q&A or 
or in the chat or any hands raised. Um, so in that case, Rosalind, thank you so much. That was incredibly helpful. There's a lot of information there and I know I'm going to go back and look at the slides again and review them. Um, and the slides also contain Rosalind's email if you have a question for her. And thank you again, everybody for attending. Thank you, Rosalind. Thanks for having me. Good luck with the semester. Okay, bye now.